we're going. Not too bad. You doing all right? I, I'm, I'm moving along. I'm doing good. All right, no doubt about it. Let's uh, let's get into it. That's, uh, finally back after a while. We had a little bit of break for those of you who uh, look for this every week. Thank you for your uh, desire and encouragement to get back at it. Uh, we've had a spate of things, including Easter and some meetings and whatnot that have kept us from a, a weekly, um, which we aspire to. Um, but uh, so anyways, we're going to talk about today. What does the Bible say about doubt? Mm, doubt. Boy, where are you going to start with that? Well, one of the um, cheat codes I'd like to do is uh, maybe tie in some of our our Sunday reading, and that was yesterday we had Luke uh, 24, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, so Luke 24, I, I should have my Bible, but uh, I, I guess I'll pull it up here. Luke 24, the the road to Emmaus, uh, beautiful story. I, I love the, uh, um, the back and forth that we have there with uh, the uncertainty and uh, the clarity that Jesus provides. The, um, the two men that are walking Cleopas and uh, I came across this last week that, um, you know, some speculate that the other guy was Luke. Did you hear that? Yeah, that, that's what the commentary, I think. Was it the commentary or was it uh, Kretzman? I, no, it was Kretzman, I think. It uh, said it was Luke. It's interesting in who that other one was. Some of the other one, church tradition, I believe, is some said that was Simeon, Cleopas' uh, son. And also others said it might have been um, Mary, one of the Marys, the wife mm -hmm. of Clopas. Clopas is the Hebrew equivalent to Cleopas and yeah. that might have been Mary the the, the wife of Clopas that right. might have been with the other it might have been one of the other disciples interesting need something to talk about over a cup of coffee um but we don't know exactly definitely do know that they were one of the 72 not yeah. part of the 12 um yeah I mean it's a I think you know besides who they might be uh but what's happening with what their expectations were, what their hopes were placed in. Yeah. And what yeah, Jesus so, does for them, I think, is the greater question. Right. So, well, let's let's go to the text. And it comes up, the, uh, the concept of doubt comes up in Luke 24, verse 25. But to get into the story, I'll just read the, uh, the text beginning at verse 13. Uh, Luke 24, verse 13. Uh, let's see. I got the NIV. Is that all right with everybody? Okay, no objections. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked they and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you're walking along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that happened there in these days? What things? He asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and crucified him. We had hoped that he would be the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since this all took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels and he was alive. Then some, then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah suffer these things to then suffer these things and then enter his glory and beginning with moses and all the prophets he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself and so then it goes on that he's he's um jesus is going to go on further but they say no it's late stay with us so he uh consents and um they sits down at the table for for meal and he takes jesus takes the bread breaks it and gives it to them and then their eyes are open they recognized him and then he disappears so that's that's the um uh, that's that oh and then they said uh we're not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us so so that verse 25 that gives a doubt um connection here he said to them how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken mm. so you're saying that doubt kind of correlates with foolishness yeah, that, that maybe that that might be a little harder than I I want to make it, but that slow to believe I think is 
a connection as well. But but I think one of the things we want to talk about is is what is doubt and can you believe and have doubts and are our doubts good? Yeah. Are doubts okay? I think those are kinds of things we want to talk about and see how scripture teaches it. Yeah, I think that's a good thing. I think the best thing is maybe we start with what the uh you know what caused the doubts with these two disciples, uh, you know, with you know, because they had certain expectations about this mm -hmm. this Passover they were at. I mean, it talks about you know the that they this they were hoping at this Passover that they that they hope that this prophet you know they didn't say they didn't call Jesus of Nazareth at this point a Messiah any longer or, or the Christ they said did we hope that this prophet would be the one to redeem Israel right and next thing you know their hopes are dashed as this prophet was crucified and buried yeah and so the doubts that at that point you know is that that long I think it was what they I calculated because i mentioned my sermon yesterday on this is it's a seven mile walk it's about fifteen thousand steps from jerusalem to emmaus so about a two hour walk leisurely wise so um they had a lot of time to think about right you know what had happened and, and the things that they have had or what happened hope things that they were hoping for now they're doubting everything yeah you know right. as another religious figure that you know, they're very prominent during this time. Another religious figure bites the dust, so to speak. Yeah. What, what did we have in uh, last week's Acts reading? It's talking about Thutis and Judas, who had uh, right. two movements uh, around the time of Christ. And, you know, the, both of them were killed and their followers dispersed. And that was, uh, I forget the name, it was a Gamaliel, the, the yeah. um, was suggesting that we should just let the Christians go see what happens. And so, yeah, and, and, and we kind of get that impression. I, like well said that the, uh, these two guys or these two people walking, these two disciples walking, they, um, they perceive that now it's done, you know, that their expectations were not met. And I think that's one of the key things is, um, is what are your expectations? One of the key things about doubt is um, will your expectations be realized or, or will they fail? And, and I think that's a, a good way to de define doubt is um, the uh, the uncertainty as to whether your expectations will be met, I think, is um, where, where doubt comes in. Yeah, especially if you uh, those you ground your I, I keep bringing back this tight you know, this noun of hopes. You keep putting your hopes on those things, on your expectations, mm -hmm. uh, especially with, when it comes to spiritual matters. I mean, because right. they had a good understanding of the scriptures. They knew the Messiah was to come. But it was their understanding of those scriptures and what they expected was supposed to happen that created that doubt when it didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that's something that's much different for believers who experience doubt, who have an understanding of the scriptures. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. But just for right now with this text is 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 these expectations that we create within ourselves yeah yeah uh, absolutely think, yeah or kind of like the group think that was happening here in jerusalem and it, you know this prophet was going to come and, and deliver us from the heavy hand of caesar yeah, yeah. that expectation was not realized and so it, it, it was um, so I, I think maybe one of the things that we might be seeing is that sometimes doubt is um the cause uh, the result of having bad expectations or the wrong expectations and and so yeah to keep this uh conversation centered uh we're, we're talking about doubting uh god doubting his work yeah. doubting um what we're called to believe and and so um let can, do you mind if we go to thomas real quick sure go right ahead I, I probably should have told you, but you might have probably guessed that we'd we'd spend a little bit of time in Thomas just because that's a, a familiar story as well. That's is that's John 20, right? John 20, 24. Yeah, John 20, verse 24. Now, Thomas, uh, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. This is the same evening. Well, this is talking about the same evening because after Jesus appeared to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, or, or I heard a a speculation that it concurrently because jesus is able to be present more than one place at one time so there's a mind bender for you um <laughs> the, the um or does he hold that off until his ascension to have that divine attribute of omnipresence i don't know we'll we'll save that for a further discussion later um but anyways thomas one of the 12 was not with the disciples on easter night when jesus came so the other disciples told him we've seen the lord 
But Thomas said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And then Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Um, so that, that. Uh, I, I felt like it would be a disservice for us not to go to that text because it's often called the story of doubting Thomas. But um, talking about doubt here, I, I want to bring it up only to say I don't think this is the same, or maybe it is the same, and I'll let you ar argue for, for keeping it in this conversation or not. And the reason <laughs> I say it's, it's not worth keeping is because the, the actual Greek behind the stop doubting and believe that I just read is stop disbelieving and believe so so there is a different word for doubt um that only shows up twice in the new testament as far as i could find um but but the uh the idea of not believing is uh, made synonymous by translations with with doubting and and i don't know if that's fair what, what do you think about that well, I, I I think that's a fair assessment because you have the the man whose son the what was it the centurion in Mark 9, you know, yeah. his son was healed. I believe and help my unbelief. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's the, uh, I think that's a different type of doubt that I think that I believe that uh, all believers face from time to time. Um, it's uh, as I, I truly believe that we are given perfect faith in the heart, mm -hmm. but it's our head that kind of steps in and clouds things up for us from time to time. Yeah, and God wouldn't give you an imperfect faith. He's going to give you a perfect faith. It's right. our own sinful Adam that's going to get in the way from time to time. And I think that's what happened with that with the man there in Mark. Um, but with Thomas, this is uh, you at seminary. A lot of times it was always argued, you know, we were too hard on Thomas. Mm -hmm. You know, we we should. Uh, but at the same time, like you said, the Greek there it was a disbelief. Mm -hmm. But this is also during a time, too, when Jesus resurrected from the dead. Um, and he talks about, you know, blessed are those who have not seen but yet still believe. There was a time coming when the miracles would stop. There would be, I'm not a full-out sensationist, but at the same time, there is a time when those things are going to cease. Right. And the word of God, will, the means of grace will be the primary way in which people will believe. Right. And 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 through those means of grace were... We also have our assurance to fight against those doubts that arise from our sinful flesh. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, this this instance with Thomas here, um, some I've heard some say maybe too is an affirmation of of his doubt that helped him get through it. I mean, I think evidence is a great thing for Christians, but you mm -hmm. can't convert people with evidence, right? You know, you can confirm people's faith with evidence. Okay, this 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 is true. It's mm. like creationism, you know, creation science. It's great for believers, but to try to share that with an unbeliever, right? They're just yeah. going to scoff at you and laugh and, and whatever else because they have their own presuppositions about things. Yeah. Just like we do. Um, so, but Thomas, uh, but you know, when you have the word made flesh standing right there in front of you. Yeah. Uh, you know what? That's what a better talking about a means to... talking about a means of grace. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, what? What better? I, I can't find a better way to overcome someone's disbelief than Jesus Himself. Yeah. Uh, so this is kind of a unique account. Yeah. It, from my standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, but I, but I think it's worth mentioning there. So I, I don't know. Just to maybe kind of make a hypothesis, I, I think I, I want to. Um, maybe zero in a little bit on what um what the Bible says about doubt and in acknowledging that you can be a believer saved by Jesus, eternity secure in heaven, and still have doubts. Is that a fair statement? I think is a fair statement, but we also got to clarify what that doubt is in the eyes of God. Yeah, and that's that's where time. I wanted to go next is to okay. once we acknowledge that is it is natural for a believer to have doubts it's often a very present part of the faith life doubt is not good yes exactly because i've heard theologians of other 
denomination, especially mainline type things that would the groups that They would say that uh, doubt's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I would disagree with that. Yeah. That I would say that doubt, you know, doubt is not good. It's not, it's a, uh, but they will promote it as something good. Yep. Yeah. And I, and I think that's, that's worth acknowledging. So, so it's something that occurs in the life of faith, but it's not something we should aspire to or be okay with. And so, so kind of with that in mind, I, I think it'd be good to to look at what scripture says about how to deal with doubt and um, you know, what, what um what causes doubt and and i think we've kind of already covered that a little bit you know with perhaps having the wrong expectations or um short-sighted expectations or misguided expectations you know so if your expectations are not met if that's what or your expectations you don't feel like they're being met that's a uh, if your uncertainty about your expectations being met um, if you're uncertain about your expectations being met, if I can finally get my words out correctly, then you're doubting, then then perhaps it's not the um, the object of your faith, which um, um, here's here's a very uh, undoubtedly true statement. God is always good and always perfect. Um, so he's never going to fail. There's there's no doubt about it, no room for doubt about that. Um, so if you're doubting God, then it's it's not the object of your faith but it's a problem with you and and so that how do we deal with that problem and cuz cuz one of the things is so i think you have faith and and if a part of your faith is um couched in doubt or you're doubting part of your faith it it has the the pro, the, the danger is that that doubt will overcome your faith and and your your faith will go away and no longer will you look to God for all good or acknowledge him as the source of all good and your eternal life that he's won for you through Jesus' death and resurrection. So so how do we keep that doubt from overcoming us? And and I think that's a, a good thing to search the scriptures to find. And and in doing so, and here's to, to just sell everything that I got to sell today, um, I, I think that uh, the word of God is our assurance. It is that thing that undoes the doubt that we have. No, and yes, and I think that's it's key. It's when you had uh, the two disciples back in Luke 24. He knows before they saw, before Jesus revealed himself in the breaking of bread, they made the comment, you know, at, well, after Jesus did break his, you know, revealed himself, but they said that their hearts burned within them. That happened before yeah. the actual breaking of the bread when Jesus revealed. And that was done because he opened up the scriptures to them. Yeah. And I think it's it's a key for us too is it's it's why we have the scriptures that you know it, it's not the word made flesh but it's the word. Right. And and so that's I mean being grounded in that word and being not only being grounded in it but also having that word applied to you. Mm -hmm. And how we understand what the means of grace too is with the Lord's supper and baptism and absolution right. all those things uh uh law gospel preaching um th those things being you know have those things being applied to you as well uh helps fight against that doubt the the the, it, the uh the monster of doubt i've heard it say and to create that assurance that you know that god wants us to have that brings us comfort mm -hmm. uh, with that but you know get back to the thing though with the expectations i think that that's come up a lot now in our conversation already expectations i don't know who started it off maybe it was me i did or you I yeah you know. you get the credit <laughs> yeah, well it, it, now we're it's coming up all over the place but i think it comes down to what creates the expectation you know we know it's our sinful selves but it's our own wants and desires mm -hmm. i mean go back to the garden of eden i mean you know when saint intended uh be starting with eve and adam sitting there watching the whole thing uh you'll be as god yourself yeah. You know, it, it was a desire to the eyes, you know, the wants and desire. So so when we do approach the scriptures, just like with these two disciples, when they they understand, you know, they were taught the scriptures, and they see those things. And, and also the group think that was happening there with Jerusalem, the people there. It, it was their own wants and desires that were really clouding the true understanding of what the Messiah would be. The suffering servant, of Isaiah 53, mm -hmm. they would be, be stricken and smitten. Yeah. Um, it's addressing that. I think you have to pinpoint the source down to a, uh, it's kind of in a really fine way. 
put the bullseye on what really causes that. And it, 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 we can say a general way, just, yeah, sin causes, but what about in our sinful nature that really um, happens? I would say, let's put a tactical nuke right to this, you know, get right to it. And I think it's our own wants and desires that, of us wanting to be gods ourselves. You yeah. understand the word of God and what he has to say and, and wanting to be in control of our destiny and yeah it's like, that's where to put it the words i was trying to think of yeah yeah so uh galatians 5 verse 17 just came to mind as you were talking about desires for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do but if you are led by the spirit you are not under the law now the works of the flesh are evident sexual immorality impurity sensuality idolatry sorcery enmity strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And and I wonder how much um, weight we could throw behind if if your um, desires are are misplaced, misguided, or misinformed, or, or uh, sought after, um, then th how much does that contribute to doubt? And I think that that's a great way to think. And and the, the verse that was in mind before this was Colossians 3, verse 2, set your mind on things that are above, not on earthly things. And I think that's one of the, if I had to, you know, get to the place that we want to tactically nuke, it's when we have our, our minds set on the wrong things. If we're listening to earthly, fleshly expectations and the desires of our sinful hearts, then our doubts are going to be prevalent. And, and those, those, it, it might seem kind of harsh to say that because sometimes our our doubts are, you know, in the context of, you know, I feel like my health is failing. Does the Lord care about me? You know, and and so it doesn't seem like a, a fleshly thing to want to be healthy, but to know that that God is in control and he's bringing you to a, um, a glories beyond compare that the present sufferings you're going through are not worth comparing to. That's, that's, that's the kind of thing that I think undoes the doubt is when we reframe our thinking to see that our earthly existence is not all God is concerned with. He's He's concerned with our eternal existence and is doing everything to bring us to that place. I also think, it, yes, that's that's well said. And uh, you did a much better job than I could have said. So well, that, that was good. Um, but I, I, it also, also, too, you mentioned something about like the suffering with health, you know, suffering in general. Because sometimes that suffering is comes from a third party source. Mm hmm. And, and and those things too can cause one to doubt. Why is this happening to me, Lord? You know, like with war, you see an opposing, you know, an army comes in and causes all kinds of atrocities to a, an area, and, and then people will, you know, why, Lord? Why does this have to happen? I think part of that thing too is is being grounded and trained and raised up in the scriptures to know that as Christians, uh, we are called to suffer like our Lord is called to suffer. Mm -hmm. If you come in with that understanding as the, you know, just as the world hated our, hated the Christ, he's going to hate us too. Yeah. The world's going to hate us. So knowing yeah, that, that and being prepped that way, now you kind of expect it. Yeah. Where I think sometimes is we're in some group, Christian groups, that's not taught that way. It's more of a victorious now type of living. And then right. when that doesn't happen. You know, or if you have an understanding of Christianity, like other religions, that what I do to meet the God's expectations, mm -hmm. you know, I'm truly trying really hard here. So why is this happening to me? Yeah. You know, these wrong understandings, too, can cause various doubts as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So so doubt is is definitely present. There, there's a couple of verses that I, I wanted to go to. Um well, maybe before we do that, I wanted to kind of just go cir circle back around. I'm glad you brought up the story from Mark 9 about the father with two, uh, not not two, father with the son who's demo demonic possessed. And yes. in the yeah. story, in its context, comes right after the transfiguration when Jesus is on the top of the tr Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. And and they come down after the transfiguration account and, and the, dis the rest of the disciples had been talking with this father and trying to heal this father's son and 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 so you can see where this guy's doubt came from because his jesus's disciples were were trying but un, unsuccessfully to heal this boy who was possessed by a demon and then jesus asks him do you 
um, what does he say? How, how does he say it in uh, Mark 9? He says, um, uh, <clears throat> the, the father says, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus says, if you can, everything is possible for one who believes. And that's when the father says, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And I think in the, the context of, of the thing, you can see how the man's expectations and even the disciples' expectations as they were trying to heal this guy. <coughs> Excuse me. We can um, debate where they're trying to do it by their own power or the wrong way. Or I think this to to show the the this exa excellent example of what faith looks like when it's mingled with doubt is that it looks to God to help undo the unbelief, to do those to undo those doubts. And so the man's expectations were were. Um, were recentered on Jesus. Um, as well, he, yeah, as that recentering on Jesus. I think that's a key. Yeah, aspect there is is uh, the objectivity of our salvation. Yeah, you know, we talk about how do you overcome those doubts. I mean, the <laughs> idea is we struggle, but it is the Holy Spirit will through the Word of God, through the means of grace, will always focus us back. Good, good Lutheran theology will do this. Mm -hmm will focus us back onto the objective reality of what Christ has already done and what he promises to do. Yes. Yes. And, and that, that's really, uh, I wasn't thinking along that until you mentioned that. Right. And, and that, and I think that's, that's heart and core. And that's, I, I hope what we've been saying, if, if we have to say it more so that we keep hearing it is, is that we need to set our minds on things above, recenter ourselves on the promise of God, uh, the promises of God, and and when we are centered, our, our expectations are centered in Christ and what he has in store for us, they're never going to fail us. You know, the doubts might come along that cause us to, to doubt it, but it's it's not going to change the reality of the one who is able and willing and making that possible for us. But let me ask you, too, as well, and it's, I think this is something for us in, in our time. It's hard for us to grasp. But during the time of, say, Luther, the Reformation, you know, death was very prominent. Mm -hmm. It was prevailing. I mean, it was, you had plagues, wars. I mean, harsh weather. I mean, sickness. I mean, if you met, if you if you lived to be forty or fifty years old, you lived a good long life, right? For many people, then, and you had to kill your own food on a daily basis. So there was death all around. So the idea of understanding what the scriptures talk about, you know, there we have a, you know, Jesus has gone to make prepare a place for us, you know. Uh, a mansion, a new heavens and a new earth. Mm -hmm. That that was something that people clung to, knowing that whatever happens in this life, uh, we have a reality that's waiting for us. Mm -hmm. But I think today, doubt has a stronger hold on many because of the fact that in a lot of ways, life is pretty good. So the idea of having to have a, that we have an afterlife, a, a, a place, not so much a natural light, but we have a place, a new heavens and a new earth, a new Jerusalem waiting for us where there's no more pain, sorrow, death, sickness. Right. That concept's really much harder to grasp today than it was for people then. And, and But for Christians who get that, that's another way too, it's a nice weapon against doubt. Mm -hmm. No matter what happens in my life, sorrow sickness wars and rumors of wars i mean earthquakes in different places i mean whatever that might be i okay. know i have a place in eternity with christ yeah amen and, and that really has a way of just obliviating anything that happens in my life now yeah if, if that makes some sense no, and I, and I think that's exactly where we need to go with our doubts is is back to the concrete realities that we have given to us in Christ and in our hope and our future and in, in, in store. So um, now, uh, real quick, I want to um, point out this is something I realized of, and I, I'd love to throw it out to the world to see if I can get some correction. But one of the things that I, I came across is that there's the, the word doubt doesn't show up in the Old Testament. In the English translation of the Old Testament, there's only three occurrences of the word doubt, at, at least in the co common translations. And I'm going to go through them real quick because I I, I kind of want to do more research on this because it, it seems as if I, I wouldn't say that doubt isn't a concept that's in the uh, Old Testament, but 
but it's it's not as as prevalent as I think in and maybe this has something to do with what you were saying that our our current context of of culture society world expectations we have a lot um more doubt I I think there was um the taking things as they're told to you for the truth that that is intended is I think perhaps was more prevalent then but but Genesis 37 verse 33 is the first place where where doubt shows up and um this is in the story of Joseph uh when um his brothers throw him into the pit and they uh, bring back the evidence of of Jacob's uh or Jacob's favorite son Joseph being killed so to speak by a beast as they said and so so Jacob identifies the coat and he says this is my son's robe a fierce animal has devoured him Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces and and the reason uh there, what I want to sh show you right here is in in the in the Hebrew there is no word for doubt there but the word um for uh torn to pieces is repeated twice so that's um, oftentimes how Hebrew emphasizes something is they'll repeat a word. And so it's a uh, taraf taraf. So he's torn apart, torn apart, undoubtedly torn apart is is where it comes there. So uh, that's that's where the word uh, doubt shows up there. Now, the next one is Deuteronomy 28, verse 66. Um, it says, your life shall hang in doubt before you. Night and day you shall be in dread and have no assurance of your life. And I apologize for not giving you the full context there, but it's not close enough to my brain. But but what's happening with the word hanging in doubt there, um, there is no word for doubt again. It's it's your life shall hang um, before you. Um, so the uh, in doubt is kind of an implied uh, a qualifier of what it's like or why your life is hanging in uncertainty. Um, and then the last one is um, in Job 12, verse 2, where it says, no doubt you are the people and wisdom will die with you. And, uh, and, and the word for doubt, no doubt there is actually the word amen, which is truly. Um, so truly you are the people and wisdom will die with you is another way you could translate it. So I just thought it was interesting because I was looking for occurrences of of doubt in the Old Testament. And the only three English translated word doubt that shows up in the Old Testament aren't actually, there is no Hebrew word for doubt. So I, I don't know what to make of that, but I just thought it was interesting. Well, maybe is in the sense of uh, that in the Old Testament with the Hebrew and everything was because there's no sense of doubt because either belief or unbelief. Yeah, I I wonder if if we can get that specific about it. I I um that that might have something to do with it. Um, it well, I, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of Psalm 14, the fool that says in his heart there is no God. Yeah, now, you know you'll see a lot of times you never see anywhere it says the fool in his heart doubts there is a God. It's it's either belief or unbelief. And I, I Walter made a comment. If you ever had a chance. Folks out there, if you had a chance to read the Walter's Long Gospel, it's interesting. But he'll make the comment a Christian many times in their life, in his, in his different thesis that he gives in that book, that a Christian will always be in and out of belief and unbelief. You know, rarely are they in that duality, in a sense of, I believe, but I don't believe. It's either you're in and out, back and forth. And that's the life you are. And it's... It, and Luther kind of talks that way too. Yeah. No, I, I like that. And 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 that said the concept of doubt. And I like that you brought up what what it was at Psalm 14. Yes. Yeah. Psalm 14, yeah. verse 1. Yep. Well, in uh Psalm 31, verse 22, I said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight. Uh Psalm 50, um, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you. Um Psalm 138 verse 8 do not forsake the work of your hands so so there's these there is the concept of doubt I think shows up in the Old Testament and and, and I, I didn't want to make that point I just thought it was interesting that there's no specific word in the Hebrew that's translated as doubt um and and all that to say it and I I don't know if we um probably should wrap it up soon but I want to give three places in the Old Testament three places in the New Testament that tell you specifically what to do with doubt uh psalm or proverbs 3 verse 5 trust in the lord with all your heart do not lean on your own understandings and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight i think that's a great uh doubt busting verse is to trust in the lord with all your heart which kind of 
captures pretty well what we've been saying, uh, which is uh, encouraging because it's from Scripture. Um, Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. And I didn't have time to track down the, the use of the word dismayed, um, but that's, I think, close to doubts or being disappointed in your expectations. Um, Jeremiah 29 verse 11, which is often pulled out of its context, but um, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And he was speaking specifically to his his Israelite people there as they were um, being warned and, and some, in fact, in exile that, that God would restore them. Um, so they had that promised restoration there. Um, so we, we, and the reason it's sometimes misapplied is, as we, we like to say, oh, I don't know what's going to happen with this job, or I don't know what's going to happen with this health diagnosis. And so we, we tack that verse onto it and say, well, God's got good plans for us. So it's going to be okay. Um, it may not be earthly good plans, <laughs> but, but the heavenly ultimate good plans, we can apply that to the, the restoration of Israel and in their exilic times and, understanding this life we have as an exile we can look forward to the joys of heaven that we have you enter, you just entered you just brought up something too that i uh, brought up maybe, a lot of stuff go on <laughs> <laughs> i think i have to go back and watch this we i usually don't watch these but i have to go back and watch this one <laughs> because there's a lot uh well what was said but you mentioned about with jeremiah you know it uh you where you talked about you know some people i hope you know maybe this god will give me this job or whatever it might be but one of the ways too that you can to battle that doubt is when we pray thy will be done on earth as mm. it is in heaven yeah excellent but he said into the will of god yeah instead of saying i hope or i you know i it's god's will if he wants me to have this he will have it enough said i i think about the things i need to do today because there's enough evil tomorrow that i have to deal with yeah you know uh in that type of sense no, that, that's great. And I, I love that you put that into the prayer context because that's uh, going to the New Testament. I got three verses here that uh, kind of doubt busting verses, if you will. So in uh, Mark 11, verse uh, 22 and following, Jesus says, have faith in God. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he has said will happen, it will be done for you. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Um, so that that idea of praying in confidence, and that's that's that amen word that we, uh, I, I love that. Yeah, I didn't even think about um, the, the Lord's Prayer as a great doubt busting, which I think is a, yeah. a truth, thy will be done. And then when we say amen at the end of every prayer, it's yes, yes, it's it shall be so. That's a very doubt busting word that we get to to have um so yeah don't don't doubt in your heart um and and don't let doubt remain in your heart ask god to remove the doubt from your heart and and he he will i think that's part of his will for you his desire is that you would be saved and confident in your salvation i would even add too with that doubt when it rises in your heart crucify it yeah lay it at the cross i mean it uh yeah. re seek you repent of that doubt that, i mean that's really there again, there's the tactical nuke in a sense of when you have that doubt arise, repent of that. Yeah. And see that absolution, forgive. Yeah. I, and I like that, that repentance word, repent of your doubt, turn away from it. Yeah. Turn away um, from it. Right. Yep. Yeah. James 1, verse 6, uh, another one to go to here. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And, and so that's a, an encouragement, I think, again, in the context of prayer, um, but not to be okay with doubt. Uh, don't, don't just sit there and say, I have my doubts. Uh, that's just how I am. You know, my faith is twinged with doubts and that's just how I'm going to live my life. No, uh, <laughs> repent of it. And then a final one, uh, this one of the smallest books in the Bible, Jude, uh, verse 22, uh, says very explicitly, be merciful to those who doubt. And I, and I think that's a good word to end on, um, both um, to take it externally. So when you encounter doubts of, of others around you, be merciful to them. Um, but also, I, I think to apply it to yourself, because if you do have doubts at times, 
be merciful to yourself. Don't beat yourself up for doubting. Um, but again, as we've been saying, don't don't remain in your doubt. Don't live in your doubt. Don't be comfortable in doubt. Um, and the best way to be merciful to someone is to bring God's mercy to them. And that gets us yeah. back to where we started of trusting in God's promises. Yeah. And even dealing with others, I like to have these self application when you are dealing with others who are doubting. The best thing you can do to be salt and light is what we are called to be. Mm -hmm. You apply that salt and light of God's objective truth from scriptures to someone else's doubt. Yeah. Even if you are struggling with doubt yourself from time, which we all do. But when you're dealing with someone else, you never bring that your own doubts into the game. Yeah. You bring, you stick with the truth, the objective truth from God's word. And you apply that salt and light to that other person's doubt. Be yeah. that objective, re show them, or share with them the objective reality from the Holy Scriptures. Yeah, and that's that's a good, uh, maybe we'll do a mercy study sometime. What does the Bible say about mercy? Because I feel like that's, um, to give away where, where my initial thoughts go, is I think that the most merciful thing we can do is to be Christ-like. <laughs> go figure. Right. Uh, but to, just to trust in the, the forgiveness of God, the love of God, the mercies of God, and, and that, that gift that he gives us with, with the new life we have, that, that sets our minds on things above. And um, we can we can rejoice. Yeah. I'm reminded of that as I'm looking at you right now, you have your clericals on. You have the black that represents our sin, our doubts and all the things that we all carry with us. But you have that white tab over your vocal cords that says that you speak the truth, objective truth of God's word. Yeah, that there's no doubt. There's no none of that. It's it's all 100 percent true. May it be. And, and, yeah, right. <laughs> and, and so and that's what we're called to do. And, yeah. You know, to, even though sometimes we're not as salty as we should be, and you know, because of doubt and our lights might not shine as bright as we'd like it to. But when you deal with those, again, it's the word of God that does that work for us. Yeah. And, and, it, and it works on us. Yeah, it does. No, as that, we're sharing it with others. Yeah. That that is that is very well said. And uh Maybe we'll uh, end there with that. And um, hopefully uh, this one of the purposes of this study is to drive you uh, to your scriptures and um, to see see what they say. So may may the Lord find you there in in, in your uh, reading of his word and uh, applying it to your life. If you got any questions about anything we said or any, we've created any doubts in your hearts, help us uh, give us the opportunity to dispel those doubts. Let us know where you're at. And we'd uh, we'd love to hear from you and um, share share what other insights we have. No, it, it was good to get back into the game here a little bit. It's been a while, so it was good. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we'll we'll leave you guys there, and we'll go with God's blessing, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with us always. Amen. Amen. We'll Take see care. You. Yep. Bye. -bye.